Uh, it's my pleasure and also a challenge this morning to introduce the first speaker. Um, as you can see, his name is Louis Fortier. We have the same name, and uh, even though he doesn't like me to do this, but uh, I need to uh, clarify that we're not related. Most people in Canada, Norway, and Japan know that, but maybe not here. So, um, and I was also given a biography to read for Louis, but I've known Louis for 20 years now. He was my master's and PhD supervisor, so I feel I can do a more entertaining job without reading a paper. So, uh, but I'll skip that entertaining part for the maybe tonight. Uh, Louis actually is a professor at Université Laval in Quebec City, and he's been professor there for a long time, I guess. Uh, but I guess he's most known for his leadership role uh, in, in Canada, but also internationally. Louis has been leading uh, some of our largest uh, Canadian and actually worldwide also uh, international oceanography, uh, Arctic oceanography projects, which is cases now. Uh, the Canadian icebreaker Amundsen also is under his leadership. And most recently, he's also the scientific director for the Arctic Net Network of Centers of Excellence in Canada. So uh, among the different uh, awards, I guess, uh, he was recently named Officer of the Order of Canada, which is one of the highest awards you can get in Canada, but also, close to his heart, also Officer of the Ordre National du Québec, which is the same for Quebec. So would I now ask uh, Louis to come up to the stage. Louis. Thank you, Martin. Someday I'll uh, introduce you too. <laughs> so um, I'm going to speak about the uh, Arctic change, of course, impacts of, on uh, marine ecosystem services. The, uh, the Arctic Ocean is a small ocean, uh, about 4% of the uh, overall uh, uh, world ocean. It's a high latitude, of course, so ocean with uh, very uh, characteristic and very uh, extreme uh, um, environment. So it's a highly uh, seasonal solar irradiance system with the uh, succession of uh, polar night and uh, midnight uh, sun. Uh, of course, the environment is, uh, it, uh, is in general at a very low temperature. And it is also <coughs> characterized by uh, sea ice, a sea ice cover. And these uh, harsh extreme conditions led to the uh, evolution of a low diversity ecosystems where the, uh, the biomass is dominated by, uh, by a few species. So if we look at the core food web, eh, if we, uh, if we uh, forget about the microbes and the bacteria and the, uh, and the viruses and all these uh, uh, fascinating uh, uh, organisms, if we look at the core food web of the pelagic uh, ecosystem, it is comprised essentially of uh, hyper-specialized uh, plants, microalgae, and, uh, and animals that are adapted to the uh, sea ice habitats. The, uh, the obvious examples are the, uh, the polar bear and the walrus, but uh, you shouldn't forget that uh, all the, the, these, uh, the organisms uh, in the plankton, the fish, the, the copepods, uh, are highly adapted to, uh, to, um, to this uh, special environment. So the, the ecosystem is quite simple, if uh, you, you can, you can uh, summarize it uh, easily, with uh, the, uh, the diatoms in the surface layer uh, fueling the, uh, the copepods, which are the, uh, the herbivores of the ocean. Uh, which will then feed uh, different animals and uh, most importantly the uh, polar cod or the arctic cod uh, which, is, uh, which in turn will feed uh, birds, uh, whales, uh, seals and the seals will feed the, uh, the bear. So it's, a, it's, it's not that simple but it's a, it's a pretty simple uh, uh, system. And uh, those arctic uh, hyperspecialists are surrounded, besieged in a, in a sense, by uh, boreal uh, generalists, by animals that are less specialized to extreme conditions, but are uh, much more uh, efficient at reproduction and uh, in, uh, invading uh, new, uh, new environments. So, uh, of course, uh, what we heard yesterday, what we're going to hear uh, over the next uh, few days, is that things are changing very quickly in the, uh, in the Arctic, and uh, especially the, the sea ice cover of the Arctic Ocean seems to be on its way, on its way to, uh, to a, uh, a demise, if you want. Uh, here we have the animation by uh, Ignatius Rigor and his uh, colleague Wallace of the, uh, the multi-year uh, ice and the sea ice uh, uh, system uh, with the emergency of sea ice through uh, Fram Strait and the uh, reduction, especially starting in the, uh, in the years 2000. Uh, with the situation in 2009 with uh, very little uh, old ice left in the system. And uh, as the uh, sea ice habitat shrinks and thins, uh, and the extreme conditions of the Arctic uh, Ocean become less harsh, the uh, Arctic hyperspecialists are likely to be replaced by uh, boreal uh, generalists. 
And this shift in uh, animal communities will affect negatively or positively the different services provided by Arctic uh, marine ecosystem. So these uh, services are, uh, first of all, we can talk about the, uh, the services uh, of the, that the ecosystem provides to the, uh, the, the, the local, uh, the inhabitant. For example, in Canada, it's the Inuit communities that uh, uh, will uh, use the, uh, the system to get their food, traditional food, and this will uh, have a direct impact on their uh, well-being, on their health, because this, uh, this traditional food, the fish and the, the marine mammals, uh, contain a lot of uh, fatty acid of uh, omega-3 uh, types or uh, selenium or other compounds that gives them a, a very good uh, health in general. And as the, um, the availability of this, uh, these, this traditional food is declining, they are relying uh, increasingly on uh, industrial food from the south. And this brings all sorts of, uh, of uh, diseases uh, like diabetes, uh, obesity, and um, uh, cardiovascular uh, ailments. Also, the, um, the Inuit culture and uh, their art, which is a, a source of uh, a significant income to them, is rooted into the, uh, the ecosystem. Eh? They reproduce what they see on the land and on, on the ice. And uh, as the uh, system is changing, well, this source of inspiration will also uh, change. It's used, uh, the ice is used for local transportation among, uh, between the villages and from, from and, uh, and to the, uh, the hunting grounds and uh, etc. Uh, the, uh, the ice also provides a, a service in the sense of uh, coastal stability. Uh, as the ice is regressing, the uh, coastal zone becomes uh, eroded by the storms in, uh, in October and, uh, and also in May, the two months when you have uh, storms in the Arctic. And uh, the erosion can be ex uh, uh, quite spectacular in some areas and that impacts directly the infrastructure of those, uh, those people. There are other uh, services that are provided by the uh, Arctic marine ecosystems like commercial fisheries, for example, in the Barents Sea here, uh, also tourism, uh, shipping, uh, access to uh, natural resources, of course, and also the Arctic Ocean is poised to increase its uh, role in mopping up CO2 in the, uh, in the atmosphere, but we don't know exactly by which, uh, which amount. So these are examples of the uh, ecosystem services that are provided. And uh, the Arctic ice pack is melting at a rate that exceeds the predictions of the most pessimistic models, as we all know now. And the question is, uh, what will be the consequences on the uh, marine ecosystem and ecosystem services of this uh, change in sea ice uh, regime? So to start to answer that question, we have to understand that there are two distinct cycles of primary production that fuel Arctic marine ecosystem. The production of uh, ice algae at the basis of the uh, sea ice in the springtime, which represent about 20% of the overall total. And then the production of phytoplankton, which uh, is about 80% uh, uh, of, uh, of the total. Ice microalgae, mostly diatoms, will grow in the ice and at the ice uh, water interface in, uh, in spring. And um, if you have production, primary production, then you're going to have an entire ecosystem that will develop. For example, bacteria will feed on the exudates of the, uh, of the uh, diatoms and uh, will dwell uh, and thrive at uh, very low temperatures. And then you have viruses that will attack and control those bacteria. Uh, on the other hand of the uh, size spectrum, you have larger animals like uh, crustaceans, uh, amphipods that will develop. So an entire ecosystem develops in the, uh, in the ice. And as uh, the, uh, the, the, the breakup uh, of the ice becomes uh, earlier and earlier, uh, this will stifle the energy supply to the ice ecosystem by constraining ice algal growth to uh, earlier and earlier period in the spring when the, uh, the light available is, uh, is dimmer and, and dimmer. So at one point you could expect uh, in, uh, like in other uh, seasonally ice-covered uh, seas uh, uh, more, uh, at southern uh, latitudes, that the ice uh, ecosystem will simply disappear. And it's going to be replaced by the, uh, the, the, the phytoplankton bloom, which uh, will occur earlier and earlier as the ice uh, regresses. So the, uh, an earlier ice breakup would ask in the phytoplankton bloom, but the actual duration of the bloom and hence the overall annual production will depend on nutrient, uh, nutrient renewal in the, uh, in the surface layer. If, if you don't have uh, nutrient re renewal through wind, then uh, primary production will not increase very much. But we know that uh, a longer ice-free season will result in higher annual uh, pelagic primary production. Uh, through increased light availability uh, and probably uh, nutrient uh, renewal uh, as well. So based on the uh, studies, for example, of uh, Rizgard and collaborator, you can see that as the, uh, the season uh, in different uh, regions of the Arctic, the season of uh, open um, water uh, lengthens, the uh, 
annual primary production increases uh, linearly so to, to uh, uh, roughly. And we know that increased primary production will result in increased uh, fisheries yield, for example. But the question is, to what extent? So we can make some, uh, some simple calculation. If, uh, if we take, for example, this relationship between uh, total phytoplankton production and the, uh, the fisheries uh, yield in a, in a given sector for different regions, we see a, a good correlation between the two. And if we do uh, use the, uh, the relationship we saw before of Risgard, we can uh, do the, the simple uh, following ca calculation. At this time, if you take uh, really high, high Arctic locations and you calculate the amount of, uh, of annual uh, primary production, you see that in regions where the um, uh, the, the ice-free season is about uh, zero to, uh, to four months. Uh, the production is very low. It's about between zero and 30 grams per uh, square meter per year. And then if you project that on the uh, Iverson uh, graph, uh, you see that uh, actually these regions do not produce enough primary production to actually uh, uh, result in, in fisheries or whatever, in anything that can be exploited. And there's actually no, uh, no uh, uh, fisheries in these regions. If we would uh, lengthen the uh, uh, ice-free season by, let's say, uh, two months, so instead of being between zero and four months, we go from four to, uh, to eight months, uh, then uh, we, uh, we would bring primary production to about 30 to 90 uh, gram per square meter per, uh, per year. And there we could have some uh, fisheries yield, uh, some small uh, fisheries years, things that are equivalent to what we find in the uh, central uh, part of the Atlantic Ocean. So some fish available, but not that much fish uh, available. And you would have to uh, actually push the uh, uh, season of open water to very long values, 8 to 12 months, if you wanted to really get something that starts to be uh, interesting. So the, the conclusion of all this is that there's no fisheries Klondike on the horizon. I mean, we cannot expect the, uh, the potential Arctic stocks that do not exist yet to replace the devastated southern stocks that we, uh, we exploited to, uh, to the hilt. So uh, uh, th there's, no, there's no, not much hope over there. There might be some, uh, some regional exception to this uh, rather sobering uh, prediction uh, that the Arctic will not become a, uh, a new uh, fisheries paradise. Uh, if we take, for example, the, um, the, the vast uh, Siberian shelves, uh, they are uh, very close to the, um, the Barents Sea, and they differ from the Barents Sea from the fact that they have an ice cover for most of the year, and that uh, you have essentially uh, uh, ecosystems that are dominated by Arctic uh, species. But as the, uh, the ice regresses, especially along the uh, Siberian side of the Arctic Ocean, and as the, uh, the Atlantic water is progressing into the, uh, the Arctic basin, there is a possibility there that the, uh, uh, the ecosystem type that prevails in the Barents Sea, which is quite productive, uh, will uh, extend, will, will uh, expand in, onto those shelves, uh, which are at the same latitude generally. So if you remove the ice cover, you could get a, a situation where you, uh, you have much more productivity, like in the Barents Sea. So on the Siberian shelf, um, the spectacular regression of the ice and the intrusion of Atlantic water could favor a shift to a moderately productive, that is 150 to 300 gram per square kilometer, uh, excuse me, square meter per, per year. Uh, so a, a kind of an ecosystem of the same type as the Barents Sea ecosystem with uh, associated potentially high uh, fisheries, maybe uh, something around 400,000 tons. That, that's the, the yield of the Barents Sea before we uh, um, uh, over exploited the, uh, the stocks there. Uh, before the, the 1980s uh, collapse of the, uh, of the fisheries. So this would correspond to the shift in, in ecosystem from a very short uh, food web uh, restricted to a very short period of, uh, of uh, free uh, open water to a longer uh, food web, which results in, in larger animals, things that can be exploited by, uh, by fishers. Uh, in the Pacific sector of the uh, Arctic Ocean, the sea ice reduction and a shift from ice algae to phytoplankton has already uh, uh, created a, a shift in the ecosystem with increased pelagic production at the expense of the uh, rich benthic uh, ecosystem. So as, uh, as the ice has regressed, we have shifted from, uh, from ice algae to phytoplankton. Uh, the ice algae were good for the benthas because most of it would sink at depth. Now we're shifting to a, uh, more, uh, an ecosystem more dominated by phytoplankton, which means that the zooplankton gets uh, a larger biomasses, standing biomasses, which is favorable for birds, fish, and uh, seals and, uh, and whales. And um, 
this has resulted in a spectacular shift in ecosystem services in the Bering Sea with uh, increased uh, pelagic uh, fish populations, reduced bentas uh, assemblages, and displaced the mari marine mammal populations. For example, the walruses uh, started to move north because there was no more benthic food available to them. So these changes uh, are expected to spread soon to regions of the Arctic Basin that are influenced by, the, uh, by, by uh, Pacific uh, water. So these are uh, a few examples of how a, sh a shift in sea ice regime can impact fisheries yield, which is one of the several services provided by Arctic uh, marine ecosystem. There are many other potential impacts of change on Arctic marine ecosystems that need to be studied at this time. So, for example, the impact of uh, rapid acidification of the Arctic Ocean uh, surface waters on the uh, calcification in key uh, pelagic invertebrates. Uh, what's going to be the impact of that on the biodiversity and on the equilibrium of the, uh, of the ecosystem in general? Another uh, <coughs> question is the um, uh, uh, introduction of uh, invasive species by uh, ship ballast or other means. Uh, one of the most scary scenarios is the introduction of uh, Alexandrium tamarense, which is a uh, toxic dinoflagellate. It produces a, uh, a neurotoxin that uh, will uh, give you a, a PSP syndrome, that is a uh, paralytic shell fix shellfish poisoning syndrome. You eat a mussel that has filtered these uh, dinoflagellates and uh, you just go uh, uh, paralytic and you, you die out of, uh, out of breath. It's, uh, it's, um, so in the, uh, the estuary and the St. Lawrence uh, and the Gulf of the St. Lawrence, all the shellfish, natural shellfish are, uh, are poisoned by this uh, dinoflagellate 12 months a year. And um, if we were to introduce this, inoc inoculate this species in the Arctic system through uh, ship ballast, it would probably have dire uh, consequences because the Inuit people eat a lot of uh, mussels and, uh, and, and then they would, uh, they would uh, get poisoned by this, this thing. Another example is the recent introduction of the Alaskan uh, Red King crab in uh, the, the White Sea in the uh, 60s, which resulted in this species becoming extremely abundant and eradicating uh, almost all the, uh, the other species in the, uh, in the area. So uh, in this case, it's my, it might be a positive uh, thing because there's nothing left but the crab, but the crab is excellent to eat. And you have it uh, served all over the place in Scandinavia and they prepare it very well, so it's, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. But in the long term, you know, what's gonna happen to the uh, near shore ecosystem in, a, uh, in a such a conditions? Also things like the impact on uh, marine ecosystem services of the di displacement of key hyperspecialist by boreal generalist. Uh, one uh, case uh, at issue is the replacement of uh, the Arctic cod, which is the main forage fish in the Arctic Ocean, by the capelin, which is uh, a generalist that uh, is at the, um, the, the external distribution, if you want, of the, the southern distribution of the Arctic cod. So soon we could see, and we have indication, for example, in Hudson Bay and other places, that the capelin is replacing the Arctic cod as the ice regresses. And this will bring a shift in the uh, uh, entire ecosystem, very, a very quick uh, shift. Uh, so maybe to summarize all this and to uh, conclude, uh, we can go with uh, some uh, futurology. It's always interesting because uh, in 50 years from now, young students can say, well, Fortier said that, but of course it's something else that happened and he was wrong. And, uh, so, but, uh, but I'm gonna be dead by then and uh, so, so I don't really care. So in the short term, that is until the middle of the century, increased productivity and standing biomass of present assemblages of Arctic specialists uh, we should see that due to uh, the relaxation of extreme conditions. Things will improve for do those animals. They are already at the, at the limit of what they can uh, survive to. Uh, conditions will improve, more production if we have less ice. So initially at least more zooplankton uh, biomass, more fish, more uh, seals, perhaps more bears, etc. in the beginning. Uh, but then we're gonna see things uh, going uh, awry. So, for example, we're going to see a reduction of ice algal production and loss of much of the sympagic ecosystem, eh, the ecosystem uh, that develops in the, in the ice. We should see that uh, go away quite quickly. A shift to productive North Atlantic pelagic ecosystem types in the Atlantic sector of the Arctic Ocean, including the Siberian shelves. Shift from rich benthic ecosystem to pelagic ecosystems in the uh, Pacific sector of the Arctic Ocean. In the longer term, maybe by mid-century or, uh, or after, uh, we could expect a widespread replacement of prevailing assemblages of Arctic specialists by generalists from the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The Arctic Ocean will just become a, uh, a, a, a side ocean, if you want, of the, of the Atlantic. 
And um, except perhaps uh, north of the uh, Canadian Arctic ar Archipelago, where the sea ice will uh, probably uh, resist uh, for longer. In general, we, we're going to see an improvement of pelagic productivity and potentially localized increases in some ecosystem services, for example, fisheries. But again, we're far from sure that the Arctic Ocean will become the, uh, the Klondike for uh, fishermen. Uh, increased population of mammal uh, and bird populations and, uh, and also increased tourism and things like that. Uh, especially in regions where nutrients uh, renewal will, uh, will occur. But this will be, of course, at the cost of a uh, major uh, loss of biodiversity, uh, including some charismatic animals, of course, like the, uh, the walrus, the polar bear, and all these, uh, these animals that we, we have in the back of our head all the time that, uh, that we love so much. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.